welcome everyone to this our third training session uh, uh, today, which will be looking at standards users and the use of standards. Um, I think this is our fourth webinar that we've held uh, in June. Uh, earlier this week, we had a, a, a serious gaming session on the topic of negotiating uh, in standards uh, to improve people's soft skills. And then, of course, we've had other introductory uh, level or beginner level uh, webinars on standardization on the topic of the European standards landscape. And today we look at standards users and the use of standards. So um, with me, here we go, okay. So um, today I'm joined by three fantastic uh, speakers who will be giving us different perspectives on, on this topic. First of all, we have Ivana Mijatovic, who of course is from the University of Belgrade, um, where she is professor. And she's also a partner of the, of the, the HS Booster uh, project. We're also joined by Chiara Giovannini, who is the Deputy General Director of ANEC, which is the European Association for the Coordination of Consumer Representation and Standardization. And we're also joined by Matan Olabaria, who's the Secretary General of the Small Business Standards. And she's also one of our expert advisory group members and also a partner in a, in a sister project called uh, Stand for EU, which looks at standardization in, in European you. projects too. So we're very excited to have uh, you two on board. So thank you very much for joining. And today, this is, yes, this is another, another of our online modules, which you can, you can download from the uh, training um from the training academy online and there's lots of other material which have been prepared by uh, Ivana and her team at uh, the University of Belgrade so today we will have the presentations from Chiara and uh, Ivana and Matan but we'll also be trying to engage you and gather input from you as the audience we'll have four different sessions on Mentimeter where we uh, will be looking at different questions related to the topic of stand, the use of standards and standards users. So please do uh, answer the questions as these are really, well, in the last webinar, it was really interesting to see what words pop up during during these. So this is interesting for our analysis and, and our understanding of, uh, of how people uh, grasp the standardization landscape and, and topics like this. Okay, so these are the other, the other two questions, of course. One of the topics today is around small businesses for who standards is often a, a challenging area to get involved with. Um, and then, you know, a, a, a but can be a maker or breaker for entering into, into the market. So we've got 50 participants today from various countries across Europe. And in particular, we're very pleased to, to welcome the 22 projects which we've got represented here today. Uh, some of which are enjoying the uh, or participating in the HS Booster uh, services, and some of which I think are new as well. So we hope that you will enjoy the, the webinar today um, and also hopefully apply for some of the, the, the services which I'll talk about in just a second. So the Training Academy, as I mentioned, is a, is a major output of, of HS Booster, and, and we've got a growing number of um, content on various areas of standardization and different levels as well from basic knowledge to standardization practice to actual experience. And we're very keen on engaging with people who are interested in, in contributing to the training academy and contributing with content and contributing with input to, to this. If you've been to one of our webinars before, you'll see that we have different services and ways that we support uh, EC funded projects in, in, in encouraging them and informing them on the topic of standards and providing practical support for their involvement and on contributions to address standardization priorities which are put out for, by the by the European Commission. What I'd like to do today is just focus one one minute or two minutes on the premium services, just to remind you that these are available. Now here, the the, the booster service that, that we run, we recruit standardization experts, and we basically match projects who apply for our services uh, to them. We 
We um, have a pool of experts and we are constantly trying to recruit new experts. And we pay these experts to deliver uh, consultancy services, so a series of meetings with projects where you can offer, where the experts offer guidance on different areas around standardization. It could be helping a, a new project to, to plan their strategy and understand how they can engage with uh, technical committees or working groups in a timely manner. But it could also be uh, in supporting access to standards, so helping projects understand which standards they should be uh, they should be they should be following or you're using. And we also have budget in our project to support the purchasing of standards or the enrollment of organizations involved in uh, in Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe and Digital Europe program pr uh, projects into uh, technical committees and, and working groups. So if you've not got this within your budget already, uh, already identified as, a, as, as an expense, then this is something you can apply for through uh, the, the booster. The experts are, um, are paid, so the services can run up to three months in the delivery time, but that doesn't mean it lasts for three months. It depends on, on, the, on, the, um, on the application you make and the type of support the expert can give you. Uh, so it's a maximum of three months. And then we have a baseline of two effective working days that the expert spends on a service. And again, if the expert um, feels that they need more time to do this, then we speak to them and this can be extended up to six working days so that we they're able to address in a quality way the, the needs of the, of the project and deliver something which is of use uh, to, your, to your project. The types of support range from the well, really depend on the type of application that, the, that we get from the projects, and you can see lots of different types of uh, recommendations that the experts are providing. And we, as a, as a booster service and as a as a as a coordination support action that we are, we we're able to present this because we're we're now running our services and we're now seeing the type of. Uh, input that, that the experts are giving to projects. So this is very interesting data that we constantly share with the, the European Commission as well. You can see some testimonials as well on the type of uh, input, so very practical input that the experts are providing to the project and very positive feedback on the experts as well from the projects. So the, the in general projects are very content and uh, find the input that the experts are providing to them as useful for them and their, their project objectives. So as we come to the end of June and head into summer, I just want to uh, let you know that we have a, an important webinar coming up on July the 4th. As you can see our, our speakers today are, are all women, and this is something which HS Booster really pushes for in the way that we recruit, uh, in particular, our experts. We, we uh, encourage uh, women to, to apply to become an expert. And we have a very healthy uh, ratio of, of, of female applicants from the project side, with around 40% of applicants coming from, from women. So this is, this is very good in what is generally a male dominated area in, 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 in standardization work. So please attend this webinar. We have Matan who will be joining us again and Ivana as well, uh, uh, joining us on the 4th of July. Just some housekeeping, uh, we are recording the event. This is because the event will be uh, published online. So you'll be able to watch it uh, later as well uh, or refer to it and share it with your, your colleagues. We'll have all the presentations available uh, today as well. And I ask you please not to activate your microphone unless, unless we, we give you permission. And please do ask questions and add them into the, the Q&A box where the speakers can uh, can respond to them either uh, during the webinar and we'll also have a Q&A session uh, at the very end, okay? So with that, I will uh, turn off my screen and I will hand over to the first presenter, which is Ivana. Ivana, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, I will share my screen. So do you see my, my presentation? Yes, Ivana. Okay. 
Great. Thank you so much. Welcome to our third training session. And I would like to wish you a warm welcome in our uh, third topic, standard users and use of standard. And I will uh, introduce you to this very important and uh, very interesting topic. So uh, first, who are the standard users? Basically, we have, in general, we have two, big, two groups of users, direct users of standards or implementers and indirect users of standards. Perfect. Basically, direct users uh, of standards are standards implementers or companies, organization, or person that use or apply standards in various activities like research, design, uh, manufacturing, service provision, conformity assessment. Some examples of direct users are designers of product uh, services or processes uh, compliant with specific standard. Tester, test product services or processes against the requirements of standard or use test methods which are specified in standards. On the other side, consultants uh, might, use they, uh, might use standards in their consulting services to prepare organization for certification in accordance of specific standards. However, indirect users of standards are those affected by standards application. For example, they can be users of standards compliant products and services. When we call, when we, uh, call indirect users, uh, we primarily think about consumers or business to business users of products. These can also be interested, uh, interest groups like consumer organization, trade unions in the case of standards related to occupational safety, environmental organization or business to business users uh, of product services process or system for which standard is used. However, when we talk about users, what? is the most influencing factor in standardization. Uh, according to the several studies of Kai Jacobs, he claimed that people are major influencing factor in standardization. All users, when we talk about that, uh, standard developed today are focused on humans as a primary users. While computers can read uh, these standards, standards cannot be interpreted or processed by machines. But the future of standardization is in smart standards. So the next generation of standards will provide tailored and up-to-date content at the right time to relevant users, whether they are humans, computers, complex machines, or small intelligent devices. So my training today might be very soon, very obsolete, but we are all are looking forward to that. So basically, uh, voice of standard users should be heard. But when we talk about users, uh, two aspects are very uh, important and uh, they are uh, users' participation in standards development and influence of users on standard development. However, we have to be aware that number of standard users is greater than a number of standard makers. On the other side, we have to be clear that uh, need for standard users in standard development is very high because the high risk of standards failure in the open market if no users were involved in development of standards. On the other side, some organization that represent the voice of standards users are International Federation of Standard Users, uh, uh, which is independent non-profit mating international association of national organization for application of standards, small business standards, which we have uh, represented in the way. Uh, on the other side, uh, consumers are represented by several organizations at European level, European Association for Coordination of Consumer Representation in Standard, 
ANEC, represent the European consumer interest in standard development. It's the European consumer voice in standardization. But what we, uh, how standard users influence standardization? Standards are basically developed to be used. The number of users of one solution is called installed base. In standardization, installed base can be a group of users committed to using a specific standard or simply the number of users of standard. On the other side, in standardization, you can't do much alone. You need a company. You need a cooperation uh, among uh, cooperation with others to expand in stale pace. Let's see the example. Let's say that we have larger in stale base of user of specific, for example, technical standard. Larger in stale base is meaning is meaning is uh, influencing the larger availability of complementary product or save or, or services uh, compliant with the same standard greater availability of complementary products or services uh, would lead to greater credibility of that specific standard that means higher value of product for uh, uh, for the end user, for the customers. That lead to, uh, to a phenomena that standard is more attractive for new, years, new users. And uh, consequently, it creates even larger in stale base. That phenomena is called dynamic of standards. However, the band baconing effect is basically a uh, psychological phenomena in which people do something primarily because other people doing it. In standardization, Ben Wagoning effect uh, is phenomenon that once one standard or solution gains a certain installed base, the others tend to use the same standards. The reason for this phenomena are the several. So, first, it is availability of solution in standards that prevent reinventing the wheel. So on the market, there is solution for specific problem and there is no need for reinventing the wheel. Large installed base means availability of experiences related to standard implementation, which influence acceptance of standards. At the market, you can find a more information and experience related to using one standard. Uh, band wagoning effect uh, is reducing uncertainty. So we know that one standard is solution. So feasibility of that solution is proven. And the last one reason is network externalities. Network externalities are the benefits or harms that a producer has from a product when the number of users using that solution increase or decrease. However, please look at your computers. I think that there is a high chance that you are using QWERTY keyboard. In that case, you are an indirect standard user, a user of the solution that is called QWERTY layout. The QWERTY layout is also called de facto standard. What is de facto standard? De facto standards are informal standards, which mean that is developed outside of formal organization of standardizations. And de facto standards mean often unwritten standards that represent solution, solutions that are in general use. If you try to search QWERTY standards, you can come, uh, come across a numerous specific documents. Among others, you can find standard ISO IEC 9995, which defines the cable layout for text and office system. It is example how de facto standards can become a formal standard. This 
is example of how users or indirect users can influence standardization. But first, let me tell you a story or a case study about QWERTY keynote, a QWERTY keyboard. Uh, it was very interesting and explain all of this in practice. In uh, 1868, Christopher Latham Schulz patented the first typewriting machine with commercial success. In 1873, the Remington Arms Company took over the production of the first commercial machine and sales began. This typewriter has long been the most important and widely used tool for administration. However, this product has had an increasingly pronounced problem. The wobble case used very often while typing were breaking due to a few uh, frequent use. James Damer was invited to solve this problem, and he proposed a new layout that would slow down typing and prevent excessive damages to, case, to keys. Another implementation, interpretation is that James Damer's intention was not to slow down typing, but to reduce a pressure on the case by placing the most frequent use case in a pair at two different ends of the keyboard, which consequently slowed down the typing. The new layout become common and represent today QWERTY layout. The motives and intentions of James Damer have long been forgotten and most computer keyboard in use today are QWERTY. However, why QWERTY when better solution has long existed? August Vorak was a famous American psychologist and professor of educational psychology at the University of Washington. In 1937, Dvorak and his colleagues published a book on typing behavior. Based on his research, based on his research uh, in 1940, Dvorak proposed a new simplified layout with several features that contribute to increase typing speed, reduce typing errors, and increased comfort. The layout was designed for English language and allowed 70% of the work to take place in areas of keyboard that are most comfortable for human hand. But QWERTY solution, QWERTY keyboard, were only 32% percent of the work was take place in the areas of the keyboard which are most comfortable for the humans. So why Dvorak solution was not into our was not built into our computers? The solution might be that that in the middle of 70s uh, personal computers were needed to replace typing machines in the tract installed base of typing machines with a dominant QWERTY layout. Switching cost could have prevented users already using QWERTY from switching to new solution and buying PC. Producers of PCs may were worried that the new layout would not be accepted in the market, so they continued with QWERTY. But why did QWERTY layout find its place in standard instead the Dvorak, uh, Dvorak scientific solution? The dominant practice of, small, of uh, standard development of organization before the 1980s was to include only proven solution. What is proven solution? Solution that is already existing on market. And SDOs were reluctant to have innovative solution in standards. However, standards are developed to be used and successful standards are standards that are accepted in the market. However, we this case is talking about lock-in phenomena. What is lock-in phenomena? One uninstalled base is created. Users tend to remain loyal to the particular standard even when a solution became technologically obsolete or when a new, better solution became available. In this case, standard conversion, switching to new, technologically better solution become expensive 
time consuming and uncertainty about whether consum uh, consumers, customers on the market will accept the solution become, become the base for abandoning new solution. So lock-in phenomena is phenomena in which obsolete technologies prevent take up of potential super superior alternatives. The consequence of this phenomenon is that standardization can only be successful if the costs of switching to a new solution are lower than expected revenues. The next term we need to learn today is dominant design. Dominant design is one that attracts significant market share and design that achieve a dominant market position. The market, in the other word, let's say, users, determines what becomes the dominant design. The QWERTY layout has established itself as an industry's de facto standards due its general market acceptance. The QWERTY was included in ISO standards as a proven solution. So, in conclusion of my presentation, I would like to share with you not something that is well known. What is power of standard users? There are diverse cases in which uh, users of standards and their representatives are very successful in influencing standard development. And on the other side, there are cases uh, there are opposite cases in which they uh, standard users have uh, limited or very little influence. That lead us to the question, what power of standard users is? Aside of market power, we can say that a lot of power can be gained from participation from participation to standard development process. But main obstacles are inadequate knowledge about value of standards and uh, potential value of active contributions to standard development. So basically, this is my conclusion. And uh, I would like to share with you, uh, not a statement, but a question for further thinking or for further research. Among all stakeholders who participate in standardization process or who benefit from standardization process or who are influenced by standardization, uh, by standards and standardization uh, standards, standards use, among them uh, large corporate users, small and medium enterprise, product users, groups, professional umbrella organization, service provider, manufacturers, government, uh, uh, small and medium enterprises and their representatives, and so on. They influence in different areas and in different contexts, disciplines, domains are not always the same. So we do not know much about how strong power of standard users can be in specific situation. But based on QWERTY and the history and uh, just looking on business aspects and see what's going on on the market with new technology and uh, technology standards, you can see that power of users can be very, very, uh, very, very influential. But my question, Biljana, thank you for this presentation. Now we have Mentimeter session and uh, mm -hmm. I, would I will stop share my screen. Thank you, I will share my screen and uh, hope you see my screen now. I would kindly ask you to go to menti.com and please name three things that describe the power of direct and indirect standards users. Uh, the code is 79478251. Uh, you also have the QR code you can uh, see here on the slide. And I think Julie already shared the link in the chat. 
So one more time, the code is 79478251. While we are uh, waiting for um, our registrants to answer the question, maybe we'll wait some more. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have five people online. Okay. Great, so we have sharing technology, buying power, reducing uncertainty, entering export markets, higher value of product, market influence, knowledge, and more use of standards. Um, okay, we have value, knowledge, sharing info, more use of standards, Regulate, implement, test. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Ivana, back to you. Thank you. If you allow me, I will only comment this, uh, this result. Thank you for your particip participation. And yes, uh, we understand that there are a lot of uh, specific areas in which power of direct and indirect standard users can be seen. But just see uh, the knowledge and reducing uncertainty. So basically, if standard users participate more in standard development, uh, the use of uh, the usefulness of uh, new standards can be, let's say, uh, better, can be uh, more meaningful, and all uh, uh, all areas uh, all areas in which we can uh, we can share, let's say, influence uh, in that are related to knowledge. Uh, right now, thank you, and I will uh, uh, leave floor to Chiara. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you on behalf of ANEC. ANEC is the association representing consumers in standardization, and I will share with you the role of standards in meeting consumers' needs and expectations. Uh, we have seen that uh, um, consumers are users of uh, products and services designed according to standards. Next. Uh, so who is ANEC? ANEC is the association representing consumers in standardization. Our main job is to provide the consumer point of view. And I must say that most of, in most of the cases, it's a different point of view from the industry. Um, and we have been around since 1995. Next. Uh, why do we have consumers and other stakeholders, uh, other users um, in standardization? Um, as you might have known, uh, I think you have already covered in your previous trainings, uh, the uh, some standards at the European level, the so-called harmonized standards, are linked to European legislation. They provide um, presumption of conformity with the legal requirements. Uh, because of this specific effect, there is a, a framework legislation on standardiz standardization, the so-called standardization regulation, uh, that is uh, um, dealing with the procedures and the way uh, standards can um, uh, be requested by the uh, European Commission and then develop. Because they are linked to legislation, um, it is felt that uh, all stakeholders have to be um, present, the stakeholders that are affected by the legislation, they also have to be present in the around the table developing the standards 
link to uh, such legislation and policies in general. They are um, uh, the stakeholders that are um, for uh, market reasons underrepresented and uh, um, the consumers, th those interests that are recognized in Annex 3 of this regulation are consumers, environmental interest, social interest and small and medium um, sized enterprises. Um, I, here on behalf of Annex, the association representing consumers and after me you will hear from the um, secretary general of SPS Maitane uh, who is uh, representing the interest of small medium-sized enterprises. Next up ANEC is a not-for-profit not organization. We are open to the membership of 34 countries. Uh, we have therefore a um, geographical reach which is a bit uh, wider than only the European Union. This is because standards are used also by uh, accession countries and neighboring countries. Um, in our General Assembly, we have 20 now, uh, 29 countries out of 34. Uh, we just had the meeting uh, last week of our General Assembly. Um, our funding comes from the um, European Commission and the EFTA Secretariat, uh, and we are very grateful for the funding, um, which allow us to participate in several uh, technical committees and working groups, developing standards at the European and at the international level. Our areas of priority uh, are um, uh, the areas that are most affecting consumers. I must say that being a consumer is uh, um, uh, becoming a full-time job because our markets are developing uh, in a way where everything is uh, a consumer act, uh, but we need to select some priority. And um, we are focusing on accessibility for persons with uh, disabilities and older persons, child safety, safety, domestic appliances, digital society, services, sustainability, traffic, and mobility. Next. Our structure is very similar to the structure that you have in your uh, countries uh, for uh, non-governmental organizations. And uh, um, this is because in Europe we have a similar system for uh, NGOs where we have a general assembly, a board, a steering committee, a secretariat and the working groups. And I would like to focus on the working groups because this is where I think uh, you will uh, find the most relevant aspects for two. For you, they present the uh, they represent the technical lead in the association, and they reflect our uh, areas of priority. Next. The, um, they are composed by members who are coming from the uh, national consumer associations. Uh, volunteers who are endorsed by national consumers organizations and experts who are sympathetic to the consumer positions. Uh, uh, among those experts, we have several experts from academia and I'm very pleased to see that today uh, one or two are attending uh, because we have indeed a very long uh, um, uh, lasting relationship with uh, several researcher university professors who have uh, um, an interest in representing the consumer point of view in contributing and also in uh, then using the knowledge they acquire in their own teaching. Uh, we also work with associations who have a similar um, uh, mission such as uh, uh, the association representing older persons. Um, we, um, as a working group member, uh, the um, main um, uh, task is to define the consumer requirements in a sector uh, and to provide the technical expertise, um, especially if um, as a, a, then a, a consumer representative, you represent ANEC in a technical committee. Um, next, please. We collaborate with the other, uh, with several partners, and there are other um, European and international consumers association. Uh, just for you to know, what is also interesting for you is uh, the uh, consumer association that is in charge of 
testing, uh, international consumer research and testing. Uh, you might know that one of the main um, uh, role of consumer associations is to provide advice on a product and services. In order to do so, we test products. Uh, we do it uh, uh, directly in the uh, national consumer association labs, but also we outsource research um, to uh, universities and external laboratories. So um, we have positions, and especially in our sector, we have technical positions to uh, then be used to support our standardization work. Next. And obviously, we collaborate with the, the other uh, associations representing um, uh, not for not for profit and for profit uh, um, interest in standardization, but the so-called um, underrepresented um, as, uh, interest. Uh, I mentioned uh, already uh, the um, SBS, the Small Business Standards. We also have ETUC, the European Trade Union Confederation, and ECOS, who is representing the interest uh, of the environment. Um, the, uh, what is interesting is that uh, you will perhaps uh, uh, learn it or you have already learned it. We, um, we are representing the interest at the European level. Um, European standardization is based on the national delegation principles. So um, ideally, we should have a participation at the national level of all the concerned stakeholders. The reality is that this is not happening, mainly for um, uh, reasons of uh, uh, resources. And therefore, uh, we are active at the European level, and we try to uh, fill the gaps of the national participation. Uh, in that uh, way, we can express an opinion on draft standards. Uh, and of course, we also try to influence the national uh, positions. If I'm referring to um, elements and concepts that you uh, you have not um, addressed yet in your um, trainings, uh, please forgive me. And of course, I would be pleased to provide more information also uh, perhaps during uh, uh, another training. Next. Um, as we can see, standardization is uh, um, mainly uh, led by industry. However, if the rules of the game are fair and if the referees are fair, we can all participate according to uh, our different uh, strengths and resources. As consumer representative, we have um, a limited number of experts. The business has a much wider um, uh, number of experts. Um, it is also logical because uh, they have um, a so-called direct interest. They are direct uh, users of standards, whereas as consumers, like uh, Ivana mentioned before, we have uh, a more indirect interest. And especially, we uh, are affected by the products and the services uh, following those standards. Um, this is why it's important to uh, continue to have public funding for uh, the um, participation of associations uh, not representing businesses in standardization uh, because it underpins public conf confidence in the European standardization system. Next. Um, uh, why are standards important uh, for um, civil society and for all of us? Because they can be effective tools to uh, meet the challenges that we are facing, such as the technological challenges. Uh, and I know many of you, many of your projects are also aiming at uh, um, uh, meeting those challenges in terms of cybersecurity, AI, blockchain. Um, another important challenge is uh, the um, sustainable value creation and consumption uh, to um, uh, uh, use energy in a sustainable manner, but also to produce and then dispose of our products in a sustainable manner. Uh, we are facing uh, a challenge in terms of demographics and urbanization. Our societies are becoming older, which is a progress in terms of medical care and um, effective uh, medicines. Um, but it is uh, uh, posing some challenges in terms of uh, um, social care. And also we are more and more living in uh, um, cities, in uh, uh, towns, big villages. Uh, this is uh, creating some challenges in terms of our societies. 
Finally, we live in a multipolar world um, where international trade uh, is supported by international standards. Um, there is a role there for standards to um, protect consumers, but we are also uh, very much uh, uh, feeling some geopolitical tensions. Next. I would like to uh, give you some examples of the standards we work on uh, and that we consider uh, some uh, success stories from our side uh, in order to meet those uh, challenges that I um, presented. Um, the uh, accessibility of uh, ICT products and services for older persons and persons with disabilities is essential and we have uh, standards that are supporting the legislation about it, the European legislation. Uh, next, we also have uh, um, a, a more recent uh, success story, and we will have to see how it's going to develop. Uh, and uh, you're probably um, aware it's uh, the uh, mandatory common chargers that we are going to have as of next year for uh, um, smartphones, but not only, also for tablets, cameras, headphones, etc. Uh, there is a harmonized uh, um, charging speed and, uh, of course, a harmonized device or uh, port for the uh, charging uh, of the uh, of those um, devices. Um, and uh, everything will start next year, so we are ge gearing up for the uh, implementation of these uh, new uh, rules, uh, and uh, we hope they will have an effect on especially the sustainability of the market in order to reduce um, waste that is not needed. Next. Another example, and here uh, there is a link, a clarity link with the research, is uh, the um, child resistant lighters. Uh, the gentleman that you see in the photo is a, a, a technician in a laboratory of a university uh, to whom we ask uh, to um, test how lighters could be safely uh, designed so that children would not accidentally um, light them and use them. And uh, tests were made and uh, we uh, identified that uh, below a certain age, children are not able to um, uh, use a lighter with one hand, um, they might need uh, two hands and they are not able to coordinate. So those are the so-called child resistant lighters. Next uh, slide. We also uh, worked uh, on the um, uh, safe sound levels in music players and nowadays it's smartphones to protect especially young um, consumers. Um, you might know that uh, exposure to uh, music to um, and noise to high um, uh, level uh, uh, of sound uh, volume is uh, uh, very dangerous. There, are, there is scientific uh, consensus about it. However, there were no limits so far. And now we are also developing new ways uh, to uh, be able to um, uh, uh, have a dynamic sound exposure uh, with algorithm uh, elaborated. And uh, we hope the solution will be uh, on the market in the next years. Next. We are also working to make uh, domestic appliances, uh, household appliances safer for all consumers. Uh, and uh, one example is a surface temperature. We uh, work to make surface temperature um, uh, as low as possible uh, to avoid burns without uh, having an impact on the functionality of the product. This is all about the uh, material which are used for insulation. And of course, uh, there is always a tension between our request of having good levels of uh, protection and the businesses um, uh, Ten, um, let's say, uh, uh, vision of using materials which are cheaper. Next. And I've uh, concluded my presentation. Um, I will have to leave at 11. Unfortunately, I have another meeting, uh, but I believe that we can share the, um, the question that uh, we would like you to uh, um, answer. And uh, in case there are any pressing, press, pressing questions, I'm very happy to take uh, uh, the question one or two in the 10 minutes that we still have. Thank you, Chiara. Here is uh, the question for you. So once again, we're going to ask you to go to dementi.com 
and answer the question, which of the following aspects of goods and services can be addressed by a standard? I think we had some similar question in the chat. Uh, the code for this question is 4373-8277, or you can just uh, go to the QR code here. I believe Julie, uh, We'll share the link in the chat. Okay, we'll wait a couple of minutes. Okay, great. Nothing. Okay, Chiara, do you want maybe to comment on these results? Thank you very much, with pleasure. Um, as a matter of fact, all the requirements are, uh, all the aspects uh, can be uh, the um, object of a standard, can be a requirement into a standard. Um, and uh, the uh, it was a little bit of a trap question, if you want, uh, and it is taken from uh, questions that we have elaborated for uh, our e-learning uh, uh, for uh, consumers and um, environmental uh, interest and trade unions participation in standardization, um, because uh, we uh, uh, indeed we we know that sometimes uh, um, the, uh, um, the 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 role of a is not very clear. I can see that uh, uh, there is a, a, a very uh, strong uh, uh, um, support for reliability and quality and a little bit uh, efficiency, whereas we have uh, many standards of energy efficiency, for example, in terms of energy performance of products. And uh, so it's very interesting to see uh, the, uh, the results of the, um, uh, of, the, uh, of the replies. And uh, uh, I would like to thank you very much for that. And as mentioned, if there are any questions, as we have a couple of minutes, I would be very happy uh, to take them uh, so that uh, I, um, uh, uh, I can leave without feeling too guilty because I won't be present during the, the final Q&A. So um, thank you very much, Kelly. So it was really interesting also to hear about all the organizations that ANAC work with as well and the examples you gave. Uh, for me as a, as a consumer, I was thinking, oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. <laughs> And that's a good idea. Um, so we do have a question from uh, from Pepe Betancourt, okay? And this is about the, um, the CE labeling. Uh, and he asks, why do, the, why do the vast majority of users believe that CE labeling is a symbol of quality? And this is a good question for you from a consumer point of view. How can we improve the CE understanding as manufacturers' declarations of conformity rather than quality. Thank you very much for this question, uh, which uh, um, we love uh, because we regulate, we um, we get it very often, and uh, we um, we have now developed a position, uh, a very strong position, uh, and the uh, title of this position is uh, um, well, C marking. First of all, what does it mean? C E. We don't know exactly, and in our opinion, it should mean caveat emptor. And if you uh, followed Latin when you were a bit uh, younger at school, you know uh, that uh, um, there is a say that uh, you have to uh, uh, buy, that you can buy something, but uh, um, you can be responsible of what you uh, bought if you didn't check it in advance, so that there is no guarantee. Uh, and uh, why am I um, speaking about it for C-marking? Because C-marking indeed is not a symbol of quality, is not a mark of quality, is a, a, um, uh, it's a declaration of conformity, is a self-declaration of conformity uh, by the manufacturers, as uh, you uh, rightly say, Pepe. Uh, and uh, when it is based on a self-assessment, uh, um, most of the time, um, the results of conformity are not really uh, um, correct. There are many campaigns of market surveillance authorities checking uh, 
uh, the conformity of products uh, and many products uh, who have uh, which are um, uh, C marked they in reality don't conform. So um, the C marking is a mark which was developed in the 80s and 90s, and it was addressed only to market surveillance authorities to be able to check very quickly the product and then to look into the technical documentation of the product when they were doing the market surveillance, for example, uh, at the uh, borders, the customs um, uh, checks. Uh, however, it has then, because it is on the product, it has then been um, perhaps based on a misunderstanding, it has been promoted as a mark of conformity. It is also very much linked to the internal market that has been um, created in the uh, 90s. And there was a political, uh, as you know, the internal market, the single market is one of the success stories of uh, the European Union in terms of uh, um, creating this market and also the free circulation of products, uh, but also of uh, services, capitals and persons. Uh, so um, we need to be very clear that C uh, marking is not a quality mark. It is a mark of uh, indeed manufacturer self-declaration of conformity, and it has all the limits of uh, self-declaration. Thank you, uh, Chiara. Um, I can't see it. Oh, maybe there's another question here in this Q and A. Um... I just wondered if you know, a company that is uh, that they check and they find is not um, conforming, um, what happens then? I, I know in in other in some sectors it's a kind of um, uh, self regulation within the, within the sector, and that it's a name and be shamed kind of approach, and companies lose lose their uh, reputation if they are seen as not as saying they are conf conforming to standard on or on when they're not is it do you see that uh, in in these cases too Yes, first of all, we need to remind everyone that uh, um, the standard, most of the standards uh, that uh, are um, uh, linked to C marking are standards that are used to put a product on the market because those standards, they provide the presumption of conformity to the legal requirements. So as a manufacturer, you follow the standard, you can put the C marking and therefore you can get access to the internal market. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, um, the authorities, the market surveillance authorities, uh, but also us as consumers, we regularly check whether the uh, product is following the standards, uh, is uh, uh, respecting it, and uh, uh, the result is that uh, um, uh, sometimes it's not. Uh, I must also say that when there are campaigns, market surveillance campaigns, they follow um, and they focus products that are known not to be in compliance. And that is mainly due to their origin, I must say. So um, the, there is a, a, an intrinsic bias in the uh, focusing of the, on those products. Uh, when a product is not uh, um, uh, following a standard, uh, we can um, uh, uh, make a difference between the um, administrative lack of compliance and the um, non-administrative, uh, so the substantive lack of compliance depends on which uh, uh, elements of the standard we can uh, consider that the product is unsafe and has to be taken out of the market. Uh, if I go back to my example of a toaster, a toaster that has a surface temperature of 100 degrees is a, a toaster that uh, doesn't have any um, right to be on the market because it's dangerous for consumers. Uh, but there are toasters with the C marking uh, and they might have uh, such high level temperatures. So I uh, I really uh, caution uh, about uh, um, considering C market uh, C marking as a mark of quality. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Karen. I know you have to leave now. Um, so thank you very much for joining us and your presentation is really interesting. And obviously, the consumer perspective is is highly important. Thank so, you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation and apologies uh, for uh, having to leave uh, uh, right now. And I wish you a good continuation of the training. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye, Chiara. Thank you. OK, so uh, with that, uh, we go to a small business perspective. Uh, and I'd like to invite Matan to turn on her camera and her presentation. And uh, I'll hand over to you. Thank you.
Thank you, Nick. Uh, I will uh, first of all share my presentation and hopefully I manage to do that uh, without any hiccup. Uh, I see, I think you see the, wait a second. Uh, hopefully now you see it uh, right in uh, yeah, presentation we do. mode. Yeah. Okay. Very Perfect. good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nick, uh, and thank you for the introduction. So I'm uh, Maitano Lavarria. I'm the Secretary General of uh, Small Business Standards, which is the uh, European uh, association, association representing uh, the interest of uh, European SMEs in European and uh, international standardization. Um, as Nick said in this presentation, I'm trying to uh, to cover the topic of the training today more from the SME perspective, and uh, just for you to be able to follow my my presentation, I uh, have divided it in three parts. So first of all, I want to. Um, uh, I have an introductory part where I will give you some background uh, regarding SMEs and standards and also the benefits and challenges uh, that uh, SMEs face in relation to uh, standardization. In the second part, I will focus more on SBS so that you understand a bit more uh, what uh, we do. Um, and uh, finally, I tried to have a third part. Uh, we are talking a lot about uh, users and considering user uh, needs, but I'm, I'm trying to, uh, in the third part, I'm trying to give you um, an overview of some tools uh, that you could use uh, in case you are interested in um, knowing a bit more in detail how you can actually consider um, SME needs uh, in uh, when you are developing a standard, if you get involved in the development of standards. So let's go to uh, to the first part. Um, I think you, you all know that um, SMEs are a key part of, of the economy. Uh, they are, uh, there are uh, more than 20 million SMEs and crafts in, uh, in Europe, and they represent the majority uh, of businesses in the EU, 99.8%. Um, in the EU private sector alone, they account for two thirds uh, of all jobs and more than half of the gross added value. So you might at least in theory think that uh, SMEs are at least potentially the uh, greatest users of standards. Also, if we consider uh, the benefits that they can uh, get from standards. So uh, we heard about this a bit before. So standards can facilitate uh, market uh, access and lower costs. Um, Chiara mentioned it mentioned it, uh, European standards have been uh, a ma major contributor to the success of uh, the EU single market. And this is because harmonized European standards common throughout the European economic area um, have removed different national standards, which require manufacturers to uh, constantly, for example, test their product uh, against different national standards. So these, uh, they are very important uh, to access uh, markets. Uh, they are the basis of the European single uh, market. And uh, of course, uh, they have helped to uh, reduce uh, costs. Um, and in addition to that, um, no, is not only a benefit uh, for SMEs, but for companies in general. Um, they actually also uh, help to give uh, greater flexibility um, to uh, economic actors because they are able to choose from a wider net of suppliers um, and uh, are able to choose between different comp uh, competitors because they can also use these standards to actually compare the products uh, they are uh, offering because they are uh, based on common standards and it's easier uh, to compare this, these products, their performance, uh, etc. We heard about uh, legal uh, compliance. Uh, this is indeed a big benefit uh, from uh, standardization standards. Uh, 
SMEs have more limited financial resources uh, to show conformity uh, and the performance of their, their products and to gain the trust in the market. So, of course, um, standards, uh, especially harmonized standards, that, as Kiara mentioned, give a presumption of conformity um, to uh, legal requirements, allow them to demonstrate that uh, they fulfill these requirements in a much easier uh, way. Uh, they all, it also helps them, of course, to uh, manage the risk because uh, they can, uh, in this way, um, demonstrate um, if uh, the product is in accordance uh, to a standard that is recognized in the context of legislation. This helps them to uh, reduce uh, risk and possible liability. And also, uh, this is an important uh, aspect. We also know about inter interoperability and compatibility of products, the role that standards can play in this area. And uh, of course, they can also help to support acceptance of new products. If uh, these new products fulfill standards uh, in the sense of uh, performance safety, uh, it's easier to gain the trust of uh, the market. So after hearing uh, about all these benefits uh, that companies can, uh, SMEs can get from standards, we would assume uh, that the big part of SMEs uh, should participate or uh, probably are participating uh, in standardization and using standards. Nevertheless, uh, participation uh, of SMEs, uh, although varies according to the sector um, and also uh, the specific needs, is low compared with the importance within the economy uh, and in comparison uh, with larger companies. So why is this? And uh, before I uh, give you the perspective of SMEs of why is this, um, I wanted to uh, actually get your feedback by using Mentimeter. So I hope my question is uh, there. Um, I think I need to stop sharing. Yes, I will share my screen. Thank you. Yes. So uh, what do you think are the main obstacles faced by SMEs when getting involved in standardization and or using standards? Exactly. I believe Julie has shared the link in the chat. The code this time is 81288837. So menti.com. What do you think are the main obstacles faced by SMEs with getting involved in standardization and or using standards? So we're going to wait a couple of minutes. Okay. okay, so knowledge and the time and effort it takes, lack of technical capacities. Not aware of the fact that almost anyone, everyone can get involved. Lack of knowledge and resources, lack of resources. Costs, conformity assessment cost access to the working group. Mm -hmm. Resources, knowledge on how to participate. Not having sufficient influence. Priority is getting product to the market. Lack of knowledge, lack of training in normal education syllabus. Don't believe the staff have the right knowledge or qualifications. Lack of resources and time to implement across the company. Okay. Participation in standards groups costs money, of course. I see a lot of people focus on the resources, which is indeed an important uh, mm -hmm. aspect. Not see the potential for business growth. Okay, so we have 18 answers. Maybe we can go back to you. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. So I will uh, go back to uh, setting the screen up. Okay. Um, so I think, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> So many of you mentioned actually lack of resources, and indeed uh, this is a big issue for uh, for SMEs, uh, the lack of resources. But I wouldn't say because I saw a lot of the replies went in that direction, and yes, it's an issue. There is no doubt about it. They have less resources than bigger companies to get involved. A way in which we are trying to address that, and many SMEs try to address this, actually is by using associations, SME associations, by pulling resources together and at least having uh, someone uh, in the association that uh, is participating in the working group uh, or the technical committee uh, to try to bring forward uh, or to bring to the table at least the uh, perspective from uh, the SMEs. So lack of resources is a big one. Uh, someone mentioned awareness, and indeed that is also a, a big issue for SMEs. Is awareness First of all, not all SMEs still uh, are aware about standardization, uh, what uh, standardization can bring to the table, how standards can uh, help them. But even if they are aware, is awareness, as someone mentioned, on how to get involved, where do I go? Um, how do I uh, actually know about the technical committee that is uh, relevant uh, for me? Um, all these issues, uh, and I think it's not only an issue uh, from SMEs, are uh, big factors. So lack of awareness as well of what's going on and the right standard. And uh, when we move more to the use of standards, a big issue for SMEs is that sometimes, even if they are interested even if they are asked, because sometimes SMEs also uh, need to apply standards because they are asked by the companies they are supplying to, for example, uh, to comply with a specific standard. But sometimes the difficulty they find is that the standards are complex. Also because SMEs are represented in standardization, we might finish with the standards that are too complex or too burdensome or too costly for an SME to actually uh, apply. And this uh, can be a big challenge and a big issue for the SMEs. And as well, SMEs uh, have less resources, so they are less able to um, count with, uh, I don't know, a third party uh, consultancy that could help them uh, with the implementation of the standard. So, um, Thank you for the, I think it was uh, quite interesting to uh, to see uh, this. And I just wanted to confirm this uh, with uh, and share with you uh, the outcome of a questionnaire uh, that has been done within the framework of Stand for You. This is a project uh, in which SBS is also participating as a partner and it's a project looking at strengthening the links between research, innovation and standardization. And as part of this um, research project, we are looking at um, what are the bottlenecks? What are uh, the main obstacles for organizations to uh, when implementing or using standards? And as you can see uh, in the results of, uh, of this question, it was actually a questionnaire that had 184 replies, not only from SMEs, also from bigger businesses, research organizations as well. And we can see that the number one issue is lack of awareness about the right standard to be used. I think, uh, so this is a, a really an important issue and financial uh, issues are important, as you can see there that is sometimes not the most important uh, one. A complexity and non-financial costs are actually also uh, some of the biggest challenges uh, for SMEs and other stakeholders uh, and users as well. So um, with this, I conclude the first part of uh, my presentation. And I will now uh, go uh, to the second part that is more about SBS. So, uh, overcoming basically these challenges is the main, let's say, raison d'être, so uh, why SDS uh, exists. Um, we are a relatively young organization. We were created in 2013, and uh, this was also uh, as a consequence of the adoption of the EU regulation that uh, Chiara mentioned before on European standardization. 
So as Kiara uh, mentioned, uh, this provides a fair framework for the European standardization system. And there are also provisions in this regulation that try to encourage participation of those stakeholders that are normally not so well represented in standardization. So our objectives, as I mentioned before, are very much linked to the obstacles we saw. So first of all, we are trying to increase the awareness of SMEs about standards, why they are important, why they should be interested and why they should participate. Encourage also and support the involvement in, uh, in standardization. We try to provide them, provide them with information how you can actually do this and there are different ways to, to do it. And uh, we also uh, represent SME interest in European international standards work uh, and also related policies and legislation. So we also have experts uh, that participate in, in this work. And we try also as far as we can, it's not an easy task to support the uptake of standards because the standards are good and can bring benefits, but only if they are applied. So uh, here you can see uh, the list of our members. Our membership is open to all EU EFTA and uh, candidate countries to the EU. But actually, currently at the moment, we only have uh, members coming from EU member states. Uh, our members are associations, so no SMEs uh, directly, but only associations. And this can be either national SME associations or European SME organizations. And uh, they can be multi-sectorial in the sense that uh, they are organizations that represent interest of SMEs in many sectors and in general, and also sector specific. So we have some specific members that are only working in construction, textiles, uh, etc. And at the moment, we have 22 uh, associations that represent more than 12 million uh, SMEs. So uh, regarding our activities, uh, I would say that we could divide our activities in uh, three uh, main pillars. So first of all, an important one is awareness uh, raising. So in this context, we do uh, events, um, for example, uh, this week, we just had one about the digital product passport, specifically for SMEs, to explain what is this, what are the consequences for SMEs, and what will be the uh, standardization needs and implications, uh, uh, brochures, etc. And then we have uh, the other two pillars, technical and political, and I will try to shortly uh, give you a um, a bit of an idea of which kind of activities uh, we do under these two pillars. So if we look at the technical, a big part of our activities is actually to uh, appoint these SME experts uh, that go to uh, technical committees to represent the interest of SMEs. We are active in the three European standards organizations, SENS, NLEC, and ETSI, and uh, mainly in ISO and IEC. We are not, not active at the moment in ITU, for example. And this year, we have 71 experts that are participating in more than 200 working groups and technical committees. From our perspective, though, it's very good to send SME experts to a committee, but these experts also need training. They need to understand how a standardization works in order to be effective in the work they do. So we also offer training to these experts and support uh, with any questions or difficulties, issues they might uh, find in their, in their work. A big issue that I mentioned before was understanding and seeing and identifying what are the topics that are relevant for SMEs. So in this context, uh, we are monitoring uh, standardization developments to try to identify those areas that are important for SMEs and that we think we should be uh, there. And also, uh, since we cannot be everywhere, we try to support uh, to develop some tools when we can to uh, help consider SME needs uh, in a standardization. And I will come back to this in the third part of my presentation. And then, uh, as I said, we try to support the uptake and knowledge about uh, standards as well as far as we can. And uh, for that, sometimes we develop, for example, essay guides on specific topics, uh, giving some indications of how SMEs can go about a specific topic or how which standards might be relevant in, in, that, in that area. And then we have the what I would say the political uh, pillar. So that has to do more with our participation, for example, in 
uh, commission expert groups. In many of these expert groups, because as we mentioned before, many of these standards are supporting specific legislation and the implementation of a specific legislation standardization issues are also discussed. So we participate uh, in the machinery expert group. Um, <clears throat> we participate in the radio equipment, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> directive uh, expert group. Uh, we also participate in the committee in standards that is the committee where uh, standardization requests so requests from policymakers to standardization bodies are approved, for example. And because we also think that uh, it is important for SMEs to participate, that there is a good environment and general conditions uh, in order to do this, we also participate in the European Standards Organization's policy and governing bodies. So <clears throat> uh, that uh, many times define the policies uh, in order to uh, facilitate engagement of stakeholders in standardization. Of course, we develop uh, SME positions that are relevant, and uh, we also try to establish more and more uh, relations with international standards bodies uh, to improve the representation on also the participation of SMEs at that level. I, uh, that's a general overview of our activities, and I just wanted to highlight that uh, in SBS at the moment, in order to support also the opinion and the work of the experts, because they are there to represent the uh, common SME interest, not uh, individual SMEs. We also have a series of working groups that support them. Uh, at the moment, we have these working groups uh, that you can see uh, on the screen, construction, PP, uh, personal protective equipment and style care, sustainability, that is a very important issue uh, for SMEs also uh, digitalization lifts and then of course depending on uh, the needs we also create other groups etc uh, at the moment for example we just created one on the digital product passport that is an important issue for us as well uh, then and this is just uh, for you as reference so i i said part of our activities are awareness raising uh, a big part of what we do is publicly available and although it's uh, aimed at SMEs, it might also be uh, relevant for some of you. Um, so we have general brochures with information on, uh, you know, how to get involved in standardization, um, about standards and conformity assessment, and also specific guides uh, for SMEs, as I mentioned, to try to help them with implementation or adoption of some standards. Uh, and you can have, uh, you can see some examples uh, of these documents um, in the screen. Uh, so that concludes my second part of the presentation, and I would like to now try to move to uh, the third part that is more about, uh, you know, all that I said is very good and very well. Uh, imagine you want to get, uh, I mean, it's important that we take into account user needs also SME uh, needs into account uh, when we are developing standards, but how can we practically do that? If you are interested in doing this, what can you use actually to do um, to do it? Uh, so in this part of the presentation, I will talk about two, uh, I would say, uh, things. First of all is the guide uh, 17 that I will talk in a few minutes uh, about it. And then the SBS SME uh, compatibility uh, test. So first of all, the guide uh, 17. This is a guide that has been developed by CEN and CENELEC and uh, basically offers guidance uh, for writing standards taking into account SME uh, needs. It's a guide that is also adopted by ISO and IEC. Just for you to understand what the guide is, this is not a compulsory document, but it just tries to give some guidance to uh, standards uh, developers. So that uh, at the end, the standards, as uh, Ivana said at the beginning, is a reflect the needs of the users, they are more likely afterwards to be uh, used, implemented, uh, and adopted. So uh, I have put there the, the link uh, where you can find the guide. It's actually available in uh, different uh, languages. And just to, uh, to give you a bit of uh, an idea of what uh, the guide covers, uh, so basically, um, you can see the index there, maybe it's a bit small, but you can uh, check it afterwards. Um, so 
it gives uh, some hints of uh, issues that might be especially relevant for uh, SMEs, not only when drafting the standards, but also during the preparation of a new work item the, and the development of a standard, and also regarding a structure and presentation of uh, the, um, the content as well. And the guidance is relevant to all those involved in standards activities at all levels, national, European, international. And I would even say, even in a fora consortia, why not? If you want to develop at the end specifications uh, that are also easy to implement uh, by uh, SMEs. Uh, what is interesting uh, about the, the guide is also that it has a specific uh, checklist that can help you um, to go through this, uh, answering some questions uh, that might be relevant on uh, on the different stages uh, in the development of a uh, standard. Now, uh, I didn't go too much into the detail because I will go a bit more to the detail now. Because uh, based on this uh, guide, uh, SBS also developed what we call the SME compatibility test. So. The intention uh, was to uh, provide a tool also to our experts to try to do an assessment when we have a draft standard to see whether this standard is SME friendly or not and considers uh, the SME uh, issues or that could be relevant um, in, the, in, the, in the text. And uh, then try to, to uh, if, it, if it doesn't, try to uh, propose changes in order to make it more SME friendly. So it provides an overall perception of the SME compatibility, as we call it, of any given standard. And uh, at the end of the test, you basically, we try to make it uh, simple, so it's simplified, um, but it basically ranks the, the standards in three categories, either good, average, or poor standards. And it just, supposed to be, it's a simplification, of course, but it's supposed to be a tool that also would can be a starting point for a possible improvement uh, of standard. And of course, our aim is to uh, improve uh, the test uh, also based on um, the experience of those that have uh, used it. So uh, it is intended for some people, for people with a bit of experience in standardization and of course on the subject area and can be applied to any stage of development uh, of standard. I hope somehow uh, you cover this in previous trainings. Uh, so, um, you know, a European standard goes also through uh, different stages, inquiry, formal vote, et cetera. And even at the end, uh, once it has been published after some time, also uh, review. Uh, basically, it's just an online form with some questions, uh, and uh, depending on your answers, it uh, gives you an overall score. So it's based on 11 criteria and 21 questions, and these questions are related uh, both to the text of the standard and also the impact that might have uh, regarding implementation. Um, and what is important to mention as well is that uh, the different criteria different have different weights because there are some um, uh, criteria that, uh, from our perspective, uh, might have a bigger impact on whether the, uh, the standard is SME friendly or not. So uh, these are the criteria. Uh, not all the uh, some criteria have three questions; other ones have uh, others uh, have one question. But uh, if I go and I try to do it quickly because I think we are late. Uh, through some of the criteria, uh, it maybe gives you a bit of an idea of what uh, points are important for SMEs to consider. For there is justification, target group, and relation with other standards. So this is important, um, um, and is looking at. Um, misunderstandings or unclarity regarding pur the purpose of the standard, target audience or the relation with uh, other standards. And because especially uh, for users and SMEs, it is important to get an accurate information about the intended use of the standard so that they are also able to identify which standards are uh, relevant uh, for them. The scope that needs to be clear um, as well. Normative references, I'm not sure you have uh, heard about this before, but just to explain briefly, normative reference, basically the standards are references to other documents, normally other standards that are necessary in order to implement the standard itself. So these are other standards that you need to implement the standard. 
So from an SME perspective, uh, it is important that we try to keep these references as uh, short as possible and that they are really uh, references to other standards that are really needed. And why? Because this has an impact on the cost, especially if the standards are not uh, freely available. It means that you need to buy other standards in order to implement uh, this standard, which increases uh, the cost and also might make the standard more complicated as well. Market access uh, is, of course, a very important um, uh, point and consider whether any requirements or defined performance level has the effect of uh, forcing some products off the market or preventing current practices. Of course, in some cases, this is justified, uh, especially because of safety, legal requirements, etc. Uh, but in other cases, this could create unjustified barriers or, or particularly affect uh, SMEs. And this is uh, an important uh, element. Um, I, so another issue, uh, cost uh, and conformity assessment is also very important. Uh, so it is important to assess whether the requirements are uh, can be implemented by SMEs and also um, what is the impact regarding uh, costs as well. And uh, also uh, regarding uh, conformity assessment loops at whether standards respect the neutrality principle regarding conformity assessment and does not, for example, impose either uh, in explicit or implicit way third party uh, involvement and certification that, uh, of course, has a, a cost. And um, testing uh, is also an important uh, issue. Uh, and we often, um, um, let's say, uh, get issues with, uh, with testing. I think it is also important uh, to realize when we develop tests, whether there are uh, alternatives that might be cheaper, and with, uh, let's say, uh, equivalent at least, um, um, let's say, uh, outcome or that uh, can be as, as as good a test, or at least good enough, that might be cheaper because this also has uh, an effect on, uh, of course, on the implementation and the possible costs. And finally, I didn't go through all of them, uh, but I wanted to make sure uh, I mentioned just uh, two uh, more. Um, the first one has to be with uh, the availability of guidance. It has to be taken into account and standards should be performance based, meaning that rather than describe a solution, they should describe what needs to be achieved in order to uh, help innovation and innovative um, solutions. But it's also important from SME perspective that also includes examples. Examples, uh, this is uh, very important from the SME uh, perspective, so that it's easier to be implemented and can be easier uh, understood uh, by SMEs. And finally, uh, I would just like to mention one of them, availability of external elements for the implementation of a standard. This is important. Uh, because this considers the availability of elements external to the organization applying the standard, which can be uh, that can be needed for the application. For example, testing laboratories that are able to do the test, um, a specific equipment, a specific resources. Uh, if there is a standard essential patent, that this patent can be accessed, etc. So these are also very important elements that need to be considered. So, as you see, uh, the test gives you uh, three uh, kind of resource, uh, um, puts the standard in one of these uh, three categories, and uh, of course, uh, that gives us an indication of which standards might be more urgent to uh, look at. Uh, this is the link of the SME compatibility test. This is um, freely available. You can use it. Unfortunately, there is a little feature that is not working at the moment that is uh, for you to receive a copy of the test you did, but you can always contact us, uh, tell us the, the reference of the standard that you use for the test, uh, to test, I mean, and we could always send you a copy. And this is something we will solve in the near future. So, um, um, I think I wanted to do a question before this, um, um, if I'm not wrong, a Mentimeter as well. So I just wanted to check with the participants uh, after my presentation if um, 
you can mention at least an aspect that you think is important from an SME perspective uh, when developing standards. Um, so it's also a test to see if you retain anything from what I said. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Maitana, for very, very valuable and very interesting presentation. Uh, so the question here and the last one, one for today, we promise, is to name an aspect that is important from an SME user perspective when developing the content of the standards. Uh, I believe Julie has shared the link once again. The code is 2459-8933. Manti.com. Great. So we have set seven people online right now. Normative references, market access to have their voices heard. Simplicity. Readability, understandability. To be able to compete with large corporations. I'm gonna wait a couple of minutes, how long it takes, complexity. Consider the standardization at the start of design and development. Resources needed, time. Okay, so we're back to resources, <laughs> cost and availability. Yeah. Maitana, back to you maybe to comment yeah. on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, with resources needed, indeed, resources needed for the implementation, and this is something that is important to consider when you are developing standard, also for the acceptance in the market, because, uh, you know, if it's really costly uh, to implement the standard, well, I mean, uh, probably this is also a factor that uh, will uh, affect uh, its uptake uh, as well. But uh, the, I'm happy that someone mentioned normative references. This is a one uh, issue that we are always struggling with, and SMEs are. And uh, the fact of simplicity, and I would say uh, even um, um, simplicity uh, indeed, and examples, examples, examples. This is really important for SMEs in, uh, in standards. So I think I will just uh, now uh, share my screen for a last slide, is really the last slide. Uh, and then uh, I will be happy to uh, answer to any uh, questions. So my last slide just has to do with uh, takeaways. So I if uh, you go out uh, from this training from at least my part of the training with uh, these three uh, main points, uh, you know, as takeaways, I would be really happy. So uh, the first one has to do with small business standards. So uh, just for you to, uh, to keep in mind that uh, there is an organization, a small business standards, uh, whose objective is to represent European SME interests and European and international standardization. And uh, if there is an issue regarding SME and standardizations, we are happy to uh, be contacted and uh, discuss. And the other point is that, uh, and I think this was mentioned by Ivana, and I would like to conclude the training with the same uh, point, which I think is key, including the, using perspe the user perspective increases the likelihood of standards and solutions being adopted and implemented. And I think this is really important and is the main reason why you should be interested in the uh, user perspective. 
And the last point is that there are some tools. I did a very quick overview. You can go uh, more into the detail when you have more time, but there are some tools there that can help you consider SME needs and perspective when uh, contributing to uh, standardization. It's are the guide 17 that I mentioned and the SME compatibility test. And uh, that's all from my side. Uh, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Many thanks, uh, Matan. It was really interesting and uh, really nice to see the tools, which are always very attractive to uh, to address SME entry into into any area. I think the accessibility to in information and uh, raising awareness is into the particular needs of that uh, of that sector of the market is uh, very important to, across the board. Uh, and it was very interesting to see the, the various needs that they have too. Um, and I'm glad that Ivan, as you've turned your camera on as well. So uh, we are running a little late, but what I'd like to do is I'd like, to, there was a question in the in the chat a lot earlier uh, at the at the beginning of the um, of the webinar. Um, I'm just trying to find it here from, this is from, uh, so I think we could, I can't see any other questions. Um, so I thought we could, we could finish with this. And so um, this is from uh, Kainash, Ainash, uh, Ainansh, sorry for my sort of pronunciation. Um, and uh, so we saw the, you know, the reach of standards, we saw the the impact of standards in, in, in uh, Ivana's presentation. We saw the importance of standards for consumers as well from Chiara, and then the importance as a as a maker or breaker in the in the market for SMEs is as well. So, uh, so her question is: Are there any areas where standards do not impact? <laughs> well, I so. I cannot think of any. I don't know, uh, Ivana. You know, even the I think the um, the Commission, even the standards bodies, that start with the standards are everywhere. And I think at the end is uh, is true. So to be honest, I personally cannot think of uh, of any. I don't know if Ivana, you can think of uh, any area. Uh, it's uh, right now. I I will uh, need some time to prepare the answers, but they are so uh, let's say awkward. Uh, or wicked aspects in there, there is a standard for sure. And uh, in 1973, uh, Verman published his first, the father of Indian standardization published his first book. And he doubted that there is a, uh, that uh, standards, uh, uh, standards uh, order, order the way of uh, a technological world. He said that uh, standards uh, ordered the world in cultural way. As you have technology standards, there are standards in the culture. So it was uh, very interesting to read that book in 1973. And he said there is no boundaries for standards because it's that that is human activities. Still, there is. So there is no boundaries. There is no problem which can't be uh, solved with, standard, with standards. But on the other side, uh, standardization is human activity up to now, and uh, it is not perfect, but what, what human activity is. But there is no anything else, there is no anything similar to standardization which can solve such a huge and uh, 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 huge problems of uh, multiply stakeholders. So that will be my, uh, my answer to Kainashi. Thank, thank you, Ivana. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Rana. So, yes, standards are everywhere, as the Commission say, uh, and uh, they they do affect everything. So, with that, I'd like you to thank you again, uh, Ivan. I'd like to thank you again, Matan, uh, and also to uh, Iana for managing the uh, Mentimeter, which was great, and also to my colleague Julie for for organising everything in the in the background. So. With that, uh, we will be back uh, with our training webinars in September, um, and uh, we'll be publishing the the timeline of these on the on the HS Booster website uh, very shortly. Uh, we have just seen a, a question from somebody who's just uh, raised their hand. Is it Yuli no. Illy? Oh no, I'll just put it down again. Uh, okay, um, so. 
Uh, yeah, so so with that, thank you very much. It's been a busy month in June with all these training webinars, which have been excellent. We've seen lots of participation and we look forward to seeing you again in September. Ivana, did you want to say anything? No, 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 just mistake, okay. my mistake. <laughs> okay, don't worry. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much and thank you for those who've stayed on a little longer. I think it was worth it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.